Sure. At this point, I'm going to move on to the next uh, speaker, Brittany Yap from the University of Toronto. The title of the talk is The Behavior of Ultra High Performance Steel Fiber Reinforced Concrete Elements Subject to Shear. Brittany, please uh, take it over. Hi, everyone, and thank you for the session. My name is Brittany, and today I'll be presenting some results from my master's research done at the University of Toronto with Professor Benz in collaboration with Professor Vecchio and Professor Foster on the behavior of ultra high performance uh, fiber reinforced concrete subject to pure shear. This presentation will be broken up into four main parts. Oops. Um, I'll first be giving some background, explaining the motivation and successes of this research. I'll then give a brief description of the experimental program that was carried out. This will be followed by um, a summary and discussion of the experimental results. And finally, I will summarize the key takeaway take points and next steps in research. Uh, UHPFRC is characterized by its high compressive strength and internal fiber reinforcement to ensure non-brittle behavior and has become a viable solution to many practical design problems, such as the ones shown on this slide. Um, despite its vast potential, the material shear response is an area requiring more research. While many experimental programs have investigated UHPFRC subject to shear by performing tests on beams, it would be beneficial to investigate a single element subject to shear without the complication of flexural stresses. In order to investigate elements subject to pure shear, researchers at the University of Toronto previously developed two testing machines, the panel element tester and the shell element tester shown on this slide. For the shell tester, a large scale rectangular element is placed in the machine and the actuators along each side apply vertical and horizontal principal stresses to create any in-plane stress state. In the case of pure shear, the principal stresses from Mohr's circle are equal compression and tension. This generates a pure shear stress state in the XY coordinate system oriented at 45 degrees to the principal stresses. The fabrication of the panel element tester and shell element tester has allowed extensive research into in-plane shear behavior of reinforced concrete, and it's hoped it will allow for a similar fundamental understanding of the shear behavior of UHPFRC to be developed. So the main goal of this research was to investigate the behavior of UHPFRC under monotonic pure shear. This was done through an experimental program that consisted of five large-scale panel specimens. Each panel investigated different uh, structural element reinforcement conditions and their effect on shear strength. In particular, the experimental program aimed to study the effect of shear demand on the crack, uh, the effect of a pre-stressing bulb, and the effect of no reinforcement. Companion tests were also done to characterize the material subject to flexure, tension, and compression. So the next few slides are going to focus on the panel test details. Uh, this table provides a summary of the panels tested. Each panel was nominally 1626 by 1626 millimeters and 200 millimeters thick. Uh, the only variation between panels was internal conventional reinforcement. The first panel, YS1, with about 1% reinforcement in both directions, was meant to provide uh, baseline data for comparisons and to ensure the test setup was suitable for the experimental program. YS2, YS4, and YS5 all had reinforcement in only one direction to investigate the effect that shear demand on the crack would have on the shear strength. YS4 would also simulate the pre-stress condition since it had a significant amount of reinforcement in only one direction. And finally, YS3 had no reinforcement in either direction to determine if UHPFRC could carry shear on its own after cracking. All panels had internal steel fiber reinforcement with a 1% volume fraction each of hooked end and straight fibers. Their properties are given by the suppliers of the UHPFRC, Dura Concrete, and the reinforcing steel properties are also shown uh, determined from three coupon tests for each heat of steel. These figures here 
optical reinforcement arrangement made of two orthogonal grids oriented at 45 degrees to the edges of the specimen. If there was no reinforcement in one of the directions, 10M, Canadian 10M stub bars were used to help transfer the loads into the concrete. Along the top and the bottom of the specimen, you'll notice a somewhat complex anchorage detail, which was included to ensure that the actuator force, which was transferred steel bolts to internal blocks, would be able to engage and load the concrete to failure. These specimens were built at U of T and shipped to Windsor, Ontario to be cast by Dura Concrete. Uh, the instrumentation included six LVDTs on both the north and south bases of the specimen, a 3D coordinate measuring, measuring system with LED targets placed in a grid on the south base, and some strain gauges placed on the rebar prior to casting. Periodically during the test, load stages were also taken where the load was reduced by 15% for safety, cracks were marked, their widths were measured, and photographs were taken. Once built and cast, the panels were placed in the shell tester to be loaded in displacement control. The panel test results are best summarized with the measured shear stress strain responses shown for each test and then combined into one axis for comparison. The first noticeable similarity between the tests was that prior to peak, they all had an almost bilinear response with the exception of Y3, which had an unusual strain softening behavior. This was surprising since new cracks um, were forming on each panel all the way until peak. Uh, but that being said, you can see a decline in the unloading and reloading stiffnesses uh, as higher strains were reached and more cracks formed. Another observation here is that the specimens with reinforcement only in one direction, uh, which are Ys2, Ys4, and Ys5, all reached more or less the same peak shear stress, implying that a larger shear demand on the crack does not affect the shear capacity. In all cases, the post-peak behavior was quite ductile and specimens were able to carry significant load at much larger strains than would be seen for a conventionally reinforced concrete panel. So on this slide, the photos uh, are the photos of each specimen after failure. In all panels, the peak shear stress was marked by a localization of strains at a single crack where fibers would begin to pull up. It can also be seen in the crack pattern that cracks had formed up to peak were not continuous across the whole width of the specimen. For Ys2, Ys4, and Ys5, a rotation in principal strain angle could be seen prior to peak. Though this was not seen in the crack pattern as the cracks remained more or less horizontal up until peak, a rotation failure crack, a rotation of the failure crack can be seen in YS2 and YS4. Uh, the LED sub-element strains shown on this slide also provide some insight. After the peak was reached and the localized crack opened up, other areas not near the failure crack began to unload. Uh, for YS1, the failure crack was located within the bottom row of sub-elements, and it can be seen for each post-peak load stage that strains in the other elements decreased as strains in the bottom row grew significantly. A figure showing the shear stress strain response from the LED data on the right for select sub-elements shows that this unloading behavior was more or less linear. The principal tensile stress strain relationships can also be used to highlight the potential of this material. Uh, these relationships show the concrete principal stress with the rebar stresses removed. For the panels with conventional reinforcement, the tension stiffening relationship for conventional reinforced concrete is also plotted in a lighter color. The comparison shows how fibers significantly improve the tensile behavior. The cracking stresses from the panels were also compared to the cracking stresses from the companion tests. Uh, the tensile responses for the companion tests were determined from an inverse analysis on the flexural prism test for YS1 to YS4 and the direct tension dog bone test for YS5. The panels cracked at a much lower stress than the prism test, even after accounting for biaxial effects. This suggests that there is a size effect in cracking, and while the dog bones cracked at a similar stress to the panels, there was a high variability in the results and um, 
We believe more experimental work should be done to determine if this test method is suitable for determining the tensile response in place of larger scale tests. Further comparison of the panel principal tensile stress strain responses show that the peak uh, tensile stress decreases with a larger X reinforcement ratio. The figure on the right shows the principal tensile stress versus principal strain angle for the three panels with only X reinforcement. As the three panels only have reinforcement in the X direction, a larger X reinforcement ratio implies a larger shear demand on the crack. The difference between their peak stresses is quite noticeable and suggests that the shear demand on the crack affects the ability of the fibers to carry tensile stress. The compressive strain uh, stress strain relationships for the panels compared to cylinder stress strain relationships show that very little compressive capacity was used. Um, a change in stiffness occurred uh, after transverse cracking, but it appears that the majority of the applied strain went into the tensile direction. Examination of the specimens after testing showed no delamination or signs of concrete crushing near the failure crack suggesting limited damage in the compressive direction occurred. It should be noted that the turning of the graphs at peak is caused by the analysis assumptions rather than real behavior. The analysis did not account for slip on the crack. And as discussed previously, prior to peak, the cracks that formed did not extend the full width of the specimen, making it difficult for significant slip to actually occur. Uh, however, once the peak was reached and the single crack opened up, the slip could become quite large and the assumption that slip on the crack was negligible was no longer valid. So the experimental program was able to provide plenty of insight into the sheer behavior of UHPRFRC and overall suggests it has a huge potential to carry shear. Some of the conclusions made from this work are that there is a potential size effect in cracking behavior as panels cracked at a much lower stress than their um, companion tests. However, a strain hardening response with a linear post-cracking stiffness was demonstrated for most panels, which typically reached a peak shear stress of 8 to 10 MPa. At the peak shear stress, fibers began to pull out at a single wide crack where strains localized, causing the strength to decrease. Uh, the post-peak behavior of UHPFRC is uh, very ductile and areas not near the failure crack will unload as shear stresses uh, decrease due to fiber pullout. If one direction has a larger amount of reinforcement then the other crack rotation will occur at failure. And finally, it's possible for the material to exhibit strain softening behavior when no conventional reinforcement is present. So some recommendations for future work also arise from this research, including the development of a robust model to accurately predict the shear response of UHPFRC, and followed by a, uh, the development of design equations for UHPFRC members subject to shear. So other uh, recommendations for future work uh, in, are based on the need to further investigate some of the observations in this experimental program, such as the size effect intention, the potential for the material to exhibit strain softening behavior, and the relationship between the shear demand on the crack and the peak principal concrete tensile stress. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening, and I'll now open up the floor to any questions. Thank you, Brittany, for the interesting talk.